Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you for my bride, and I thank you for this opportunity right now for her to, uh, to get up and to teach and to instruct and to lead and mentor um, not just the young people in the room, but all of us who have ears to hear, Lord. I just pray that uh, her words would be yours, that you would take them wherever you would, and that this would be used for our good, but most of all for your glory. Father, we love you, we praise you, and I pray all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hello. Well, like my boo said, my name is Miss Maya, and we are in a series called Equip. And what we're doing is we really want to give you some tools to learn to study the Bible for yourself because we know that you are highly capable. And like I said last week, if you were here, I really think sometimes you all are capable of a lot more than we give you. You all are smart. You are very, very smart. And you're capable of more than sometimes what we give you. Sometimes we just spoon feed you the Bible. And this the whole series is set up to teach you to study the Bible for yourself. Like I always tell my kids and my students, don't take my word for it. What I say here, go home and read your Bible and check it out for yourself. Look into the Word of God for yourself. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to give you some very simple things that you can implement to learn to read the Bible for yourself. So last week, if you were here, we did the hand method, a very simple method for when you read your Bible of things to look for. Does anybody remember all six things? Not a leader. Don't look at your notes. No getting out your notes. Does anyone remember all six things that we learned? A hundred dollars is on the line here, y'all. No looking at your no looking at your notes. We're we're having integrity. You'll see. Aiden, can you do it? Okay, say it really loud so everybody can hear you. Everybody be quiet so Aiden can say it loud. Yes, emphasized. Repeated. Related. Uh, close. Alike. And, and what was the poem? Bro! That was incredible. Can we all give it up for Aiden? That was incredible. Aiden, you get $100. Swag socks, come get your prize. That was really, really good. That was awesome. Okay, so great job, Aiden. Wow, that you blew my mind with that. Good job. So last week we talked about look for things that are emphasized, repeated, related, alike, unalike, and true to life. So that's what we talked about last week. Great job, Aiden. That was really good. This week, we are going to talk about that the Bible is one story. It's the gospel story. But the Bible is made of how many books? It's six, 66 books. Yeah, the Bible is 66 books. But it's beautifully woven together into one story, the gospel story. But as you read your Bible, it's really important to understand that there are different writing styles in the Bible, and you read them differently. So we're going to start off with a video from the Bible Project. Hold on just a second. But before we get into the video, I want to tell you, today we're going to do a fun thing. I've got, everybody should have a note, paper, and a pen. And I got some more swag socks, Baby Yoda. So what is going to happen is every leader is going to get some swag socks. And every student, no, they don't get to keep them. They're going to give them out. They're not for them. So every, every small group is going to get one pair of socks. What you're going to do is you're going to take really good notes, OK? And I'm going to leave it up to your leader to decide if you took good notes. The point is that you just try your best, okay? So every leader, it's going to be up to their discretion if they think you tried and you took good notes during this time. So during the small group, you can turn in your notes, write your name on it, they're going to fold it up, and then they're going to, you'll be entered into a drawing for your swag socks. So every small group 
will get a pair of swag socks, but you have to take good notes to be entered because taking notes is a really good way. When you take notes, it engages your mind in a way that it just listening doesn't. So taking notes is a great way to remember stuff. So everybody is gonna get one pair of swag socks for their small group. And if you take good notes, then you'll be entered in to win that. So make sure you take good notes. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and go, we're gonna watch a video from the Bible Project. And it talks about different writing styles in the Bible. So just pay attention to that and take some notes and we'll talk about it after. telling one unified story from beginning to end. But all those books were written in different literary styles. Yeah, think of it like walking into a bookstore where every aisle has a different kind of literature. There's history or poetry or nonfiction. And when you choose an aisle and pick up a book, you're going to have very different expectations, different things that you're looking for. Right, they're all literature, but they communicate in really different ways. Yes, and so the same thing is true for the Bible. If you don't pay attention to what style it's written in, you will miss out on the brilliance of each book. So, what are the main types of literature in the Bible? Well, first and foremost is narrative. It makes up a whopping 43% of the Bible. After that is poetry, which is 33% of the Bible. And then there's what you could call prose discourse, which makes up the remaining 24%. Nearly half the Bible is narrative. Yes, and this is no accident. Stories are the most universal form of human communication. Our brains are actually hardwired to take in information through story. And stories are really enjoyable. Why is that? Well, stories train us to make sense of the seemingly random events that happen in life by taking those events and then putting them in a sequence. And then together you can start to see the meaning and purpose of it all. And what links this all together? Well, good stories always have a character who wants something. And then through these characters, an author can explore life's big questions like who are we or what's really important in life. And a good story always involves some kind of conflict some challenge to overcome, just like in our own lives. And that forces us to think about our own challenges, why there's so much pain or disappointment in the world, and then what can we do about it? And stories usually end with some kind of resolution, giving us hope for our own stories. Since these are Bible stories, are the characters showing me how I should live? Yeah, that's not quite the point. Most Bible characters are deeply flawed. You should not be like them. But we are supposed to see ourselves in them, which helps us then see our lives and failures from a new perspective. And without even realizing it, these stories will start to mess with you and change how you see the world and other people and yourself. Now, there are different types of narrative in the Bible. Yeah, there's historical narrative, but also narrative parables, short biographical narratives like the four gospels. We'll look at all these in later videos. Okay, next up is poetry, which honestly, I don't read a lot of. Yeah, you're like most people. But one out of every three chapters in the Bible is poetry. Yeah, why so much poetry? Well, poems mainly speak through dense, creative language, linking together images to help us envision the world differently. Poems use lots of metaphor to evoke your emotions and your imagination. Lots of fancy language, but wouldn't it be easier just to tell me what I need to know? Well, think about it. In life, we tend to form mental ruts, and we think in these familiar, well-worn paths that are very hard to get out of through logic or reasoning. And what good poetry does is force you off the familiar path into new territory. Sneaky. And there's different types of poetry in the Bible. There's lots of types of songs or psalms. There's the reflective poetry of the wisdom books and then the passionate resistance poetry of the prophets. Okay, the last big literary type is called prose discourse and it makes up a quarter of the Bible. Yeah, these are speeches, letters, or essays. And the focus here is building a sequence of ideas or thoughts into one linear argument that requires a logical response. Like, hey, have you thought about this thing? You should also consider how it connects to this other thing. And if you do, then you will see that this is the result. And in light of that conclusion, therefore, you should probably stop doing that one thing so that this other thing will be the outcome. So you're persuading me with reason. Yeah, discourse forces you to think logically and consistently and then do something about it. Biblical discourse is found in law collections, in wisdom literature, and the letters written by the apostles. 
Okay, so each book of the Bible has one literary style. No, actually most books have a primary literary style, like narrative, for example. But then embedded in the narrative, you'll come across poems or parables or a collection of laws. Every biblical book is a unique combination of literary styles. And to read that book well, I need to be familiar with each literary type and how it works. Yeah, so you know what to pay attention to and what questions you should ask. But before we look at each type, there's one more unifying feature of biblical literature that's really important and really cool, and that's what we'll explore next. Okay, so they did a really great job in that video breaking down into three main writing styles in the Bible. Does anybody know one of them? Kara. Say it really loud. Poetry, yes, good. So what, what did they say about poetry? How do we know it's going to be poetry when we're reading it? Judah? Figurative language, metaphors, really flowery, beautiful, great job. Okay, what was the other one? Uh, let's raise our hands, but go ahead. Narrative, yeah. How are you going to know if it's narrative? Uh, Brandon. Okay, that's okay. Anybody else? How, what are some things that would kind of clue you into, hey, this is narrative? Avea. Biography, yeah, it's telling a story of someone. Yeah, stories. Those, those are the big things with narratives, the gospels. It's all going to be telling stories because stories are very powerful ways to learn and they engage our mind in ways that other literature doesn't. So what's the, what was the third one? Alexis? Discourse. And that might be a little bit challenging, but what did he say discourse is? Um, I forget your name. I know it. It's right here. Red hair. Wyatt? No. Bennett. I knew it was something with a Bennett. It makes you think. Yep. What else? Judah? Very good. A bunch of ideas thrown together to support an argument. Yeah. Letters, stuff like that. Okay. So that would be discourse. Good job. Okay, so those are the three main things that they broke it up into. So as you read the Bible, you want to look for those different cues and try to figure out what kind of writing it is. And in your small group, you're going to go through some writings together and you're going to kind of work through it as a group and talk through the text and figure out what kind of writing it is. And there's some questions to kind of work through what the text says, okay? So we're going to break down one key passage here. We're going to hit Jeremiah chapter 1. So if you have your Bible, please bring your Bible, okay? And if you need a Bible, we have a ton of Bibles. We would love to give you a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, please see your leader and we can get you a Bible. But please try to bring your personal Bible. And if you forgot it, that's okay. But try when you come to bring your personal Bible. That will be very helpful because you can highlight things in your own Bible. You can write little prayers. You can write ways you still saw God show up and take notes. Make it personal to you. My Bible is very personal to me. So make your Bible personal to you. So bring your Bible. So we're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 1. And we're just going to kind of work through the things. We're going to do some things that we talked about last week and also some things that are new this week. We're just going to kind of work through the text together. So Jeremiah chapter 1. And while you all are getting there, and if you don't know where the book of Jeremiah is, it's about halfway. And that's okay. If you do not know where the book is, that is totally okay. Do not ever be embarrassed. There is an index at the front of your Bible that you can look where it's at. And that's why we come here. And that's why we learn to learn. So don't ever be embarrassed if you don't know where a book is at. Just look it up in the front. So Jeremiah chapter 1. And while you're turning there, I am going to just give you a few things to think about. As you read the Bible, there should be a slide that says context is key. Context is key. Remember, as you read your Bible, context is key. And what that means is that 
you need to ask yourself some questions as you're reading your Bible. When you're reading a book, ask yourself, who wrote this book? Who was it written to? What was the primary audience? What was going on with them at that time? Why was this written? And think about the Bible as one story, the gospel story. And we're going to talk more about that next week of reading the Bible as a whole story. So when you come to something in the Bible, you want to try to think about where does this fall in the gospel story? Is it before Christ, before his death and resurrection, or is it after Christ? Because a lot changed. So you want to think about where does this fall in the storyline of the Bible? And like I said, we're going to talk about that next week. But a big thing is if you can think about, okay, was this before Jesus came to the earth or was it after? That's really going to help you, okay? So Jeremiah, was Jeremiah before Jesus came and lived as a human, died, resurrected? was before? Yes, good. I was trying to trick you, but you're too smart. Yeah, so the Old Testament, everybody understands the Old Testament is the first part. That's before Jesus came on the earth. The New Testament is after, okay? So we're going to start with Jeremiah chapter 1, and I want you to be thinking about some of these questions that you've been learning. Jeremiah 1.1. 1, 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests who were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the captivity of Jerusalem in the fifth month. Okay, so that's a lot right there, and that tells you a lot. You're probably like, what does that mean? First of all, Remember last week we said, look for what is repeated. What's repeated that I just read? Um, go ahead. Grayson. King of Judah. Yes. It says it three times, right? At three times it says, King of Judah. And last week we talked about when God repeats things, it's because he's showing us, hey, this is important. Just like your parents repeat the same thing over and over again to you probably, right? What's some things your parents tell you? Clean your room. Do the dishes. Yeah. Your parents tell you the same thing over and over again because they're saying this is important. So God, when he says things over and over again, he's doing it for our sake. He's saying this is important. So, great catch. King of Judah. So right there... God is trying to tell us, hey, when was this going on? When is Jeremiah's, when is he living? When is this book being written? During the time of the kings. Yeah. It was during the time when the kings ruled, okay? And you may not know what that means. We're going to talk about the whole storyline of the Bible next week, and that's okay. But at least you know, okay, this was going on in the time period of the kings. And the words of Jeremiah, it says, his dad, what was his dad? Look at verse 1. What was his dad's job? Yes, his dad's name was Hilkiah. Yeah. So his dad was a priest, right? So in those days, what your dad did was most likely what you were going to do. Okay, so what do you think Jeremiah is thinking that he's going to be when he grows up? Judah, let's, let's do our hands, okay? Judah in the back. You know, Judah's are like right there. Judah in the back. Yeah, he's probably thinking, I'm going to be a priest. Because priests grew up and their sons were priests, and this is how it went. Okay, so, verse 4 says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. And I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Okay, so here God is completely flipping the script for him. What does God say you're going to be, Jeremiah? Aiden? A prophet. Yeah. So here this young boy is thinking, I'm going to be a priest. And then God shows up and he's like, hey, you're going to be a prophet. I appointed you and I made you to be a prophet. Anybody know about the prophets of Israel? 
what happened to most of them. A lot of times they were put to death. Yeah. It wasn't really a great thing that you'd really want to be a prophet. Most of the times the kings hated the prophets because the prophets would call people back to God. And most of the kings, they didn't want anything to do with God. They wanted to do their own thing. So a lot of times they ended up killing prophets. So this is not something that Jeremiah probably really wants to jump into real fast. And let's go on. In verse 6, he says, Then I said, this is Jeremiah speaking, O oh Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. So right there, Jeremiah is saying, God, I can't be a prophet. Why does he, get, why does he say, I can't be a prophet, God? Yeah, he's young and he's like, I don't know how to speak. I'm just a kid. And I'm going to go to the king and tell him God says this. Yeah, so this is a difficult assignment. And Jeremiah's like, God, I don't think I can do this. I'm only a child and I don't even know how to speak. And God goes on to say, but the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a youth. For to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. So I love it. God comes back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah says, God, I cannot be a prophet because I'm just a little kid. He was probably about your age, maybe a little older, but he was young. He says, God, I'm just a kid, and I don't even know how to speak well. And I love what God says. God comes back and says, Jeremiah. I made your mouth. Before you were even born, I hand-formed you for your assignment. I made you for this. And we're going to skip a little bit ahead here, but I want, I want to break this down. So what kind of writing is this? Judah. What did you say? Maybe I could maybe see that, but I think maybe there's something maybe that would fit a little better. Uh, Judah in the back. Narrative, yeah. I, think it, I would think it would probably fit narrative a little bit better because it's just talking about what happened. It's talking about Jeremiah's call to be a prophet. So, yes, that, that is great. And we're going to go on, and we're going to skip just for time period. I wish we had time to read this all. Go home and read Jeremiah 1 and 2. It's awesome, especially if you're a student. Because God is showing, hey, I use kids just like I use adults. Don't ever use that excuse that I can't because I'm just a kid. God loves to call kids to do amazing things. So we're going to skip ahead to Jeremiah 2. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Go and proclaim in, in the hearing of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness, in a land not sown. So here, God is telling Jeremiah to give the people a message. And then it does switch. And Judah, I'm glad that you caught on to this. Because this is showing us that writings, they can switch. They're not always historical narrative, and they just stay with it the whole book. So here, what, what do we switch to? You already said it, Judah. Poetry, Yeah. God is saying, God's calling his people back. He's saying, hey, remember how you used to love me? You were devoted to me like a bride. You followed me in the wilderness. And sometimes people think God is far off and he's removed and he's distant and he just judges. But I'd like you to look at this first. Can you hear the heartbreak of God? Because God is saying, I remember how you used to love me. I used to follow me. You were devoted to me like a bride. Yeah, he uses that beautiful poetry of a bride who's so in love that she would follow him anywhere. And let's skip down to verse 4, the bottom of verse 4. God says, what wrong did your fathers find in me that they went far from me? And you can again hear the heartbreak of God that's saying, what did I do so wrong that my people left me? I was like, what did I do? What did I ever do except love you and provide for you and care for you? And you went after all the garbage of the world and you left me. And verse 13, 
This is God speaking through Jeremiah. For my people have committed two evils and they've forsaken me, the fountain of living water. And they've hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. What's a cistern? Oh, let's get a girl. Gray shirt. Yeah, it's like a well that, it, that you make. And so God's saying, my people have committed two evils against me. And this is, the, this is the message that Jeremiah is bringing to the people. And God says, my people have committed two sins. What does he say first of all? What? Yeah, he's saying they've forsaken me, the fount of living water. Again, we hear that poetry, right? God's like... Hey, I'm a fountain of living water and my people have left me. And then he's saying, and then they went after garbage that's not even going to fill them. They left me. I'm the one that can fill them. And they went after all the garbage of the world, broken cisterns that can't even hold water. And so here in this text, we see two different things. First, we saw what? What kind of writing style? Narrative. And then what does God switch to? Yeah, so I'm showing you within books, it can switch. It's not always one thing. So you want to look at it. Is God literally saying, I am a fountain of literal water, like he's a water fountain? No, what's he saying in that? What are some things he's communicating? Yeah, that he provides. We can't survive without water, right? Yeah, so that's poetry. That's God teaching of himself. So great job, guys. This... I, I really would like you to go home and read Jeremiah 1 and 2. And I want, I want you to take this away from this story. You have been created by God on purpose for your purpose. Just like God told Jeremiah, before you were even born, when you were in your mother's womb, I created you to be a prophet. And God created you for the purpose that he has in the world. There are problems that God wants to solve in the world, so he handcrafted you for your assignment. And you might be like, Miss Maya, how do you know that? You don't even know me. I know that because God says it. In Ephesians 2.10, God says, You are God's masterpiece. You, every single one of you, are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand that we might walk in them. So if you're here tonight and you're thinking, man, I'm just garbage, and I've been there. You know, you can get really beat up by the world. You can just feel like, I just, I just don't even know what my life's worth. I don't even know what I'm doing. I don't even know if I have a purpose. That's the enemy. That is the enemy. Because that's not God. God says you are God's masterpiece. Created for a purpose that he has. He handcrafted every single one of you. I can't do your assignment. You can't do mine. You were created on purpose for a purpose. That's what I really want you to take away from this text in Jeremiah. If you heard nothing else, I want you to know you have a purpose. Your life is not worthless. You were created for purpose good works that God prepared long ago for you to walk in them. So as we close up, I'm going to give you each one honey stick. Yeah. So the leaders are going to pass you out. Hold on to them until everybody gets one, okay? If you're allergic to honey, please don't take one. <laughs> Or if you don't like one, you don't, ha you don't have to have one. Is anybody allergic to honey? So the leaders are going to pass out one honey stick per person. If you okay, don't need it yet. Just hold on to it. Just hold on to it. Don't even put it in your mouth. Too much temptation. Wait till everybody gets it. Okay, raise your hand if you still need one. And a leader will get you one. Andrew wants, Andrew wants a hookup of honey in the back. 
Can we just give Andrew a round of applause? Yes, because you know, AV people, they are awesome and they don't get the affirmation they deserve because he just hides back there. But man, if we did not have an AV person, that would be bad. Okay, so does everybody have your honey stick? Unless you're allergic. Please don't take any honey if you are allergic to honey. Okay, so I want you, you can bite the end off and then you can suck it, okay? And while you're, while you're eating this, I want to tell you that Psalm 1910, I love what David said in Psalm 1910. David said, your, hey guys, focus on your eyes. Your mouth should only be eating, not talking. I love what David, King David said in Psalm 1910. David said, your word is sweeter than honey, sweeter than honey from the comb. And this is what God's word tastes like. God's word is nourishing. It is good for you. It is healing. And that has been my prayer over the course of these last two weeks. I have been praying, Lord, show these kids that your word is sweeter than honey. Give them a hunger for the word of God. Create in them a hunger for your words. And this is what God's word tastes like. And I'm going to go ahead and close up. You can finish your honey. One thing I do ask is that you, when you walk out, you don't throw your honey stick down for somebody else to have to clean up, okay? But please take it with you and toss it in the garbage. All right, I'm going to close this up in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for every one of these students who just like Jeremiah, you knit them together in their mother's womb and you created them for a purpose, Lord. And I pray that they would know that, that they would know what they were created for, Lord, that they were created to give you glory and to bring you glory, God, and to make you known on this earth. And Lord, I pray that they would know your word is sweeter than honey. It's sweeter than honey from the comb. I pray you would give them such a hunger for it. Lord, I pray right now, supernaturally, that you would give these students a hunger for your word. Lord, they would want to go dive into the rest of Jeremiah, and they want to know his story, God. I pray your word would live in us, that it would abide in us, God, that it would overflow out of us. I pray we would hide it in our hearts, that we would not sin against you, that we would hide it in our hearts to know the right way to go, God. Give us a hunger for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. And Drew is going to close this up in a song. And so this is your time. I want you to just respond to God, worship, if you need to pray, if you need to talk to your leader about something, this is your time. But please don't talk to your neighbor. We really want you to just focus on God, talking to God. And please don't distract your neighbor. All right, y'all stand up to your feet. Y'all, I hate honey. And I just learned that very, very bad. You're not like honey. We're going to sing gratitude together. All my words. got nothing new. How could I 